my lovely imps. Today on the show, we are going to be talking about uh, Andrew Callahan. Andrew Call Callahan is a left-leaning uh, uh, content creator, uh, formerly associated with a show called All Gas No Breaks, uh, formerly or currently associated with a show called Channel 5 News, um, and also currently affiliated uh, with HBO um, for a show that I constantly forget the name of. Uh, it doesn't really matter all that much. That part doesn't really matter all that much. Now, um, as a warning, this section is going to have uh, some pretty severe discussions of sexual assault and rape. Um, this is so trigger warning, genuinely. If this is something that bothers you, please do not feel like you have to stay present. The purpose of this section is to get all of the information in one place. Uh, uh, because uh, Andrew Callahan is an incredibly popular figure uh, and also appears to be, have been a, uh, a very prolific uh, uh, pract a practitioner of sexual violence. Let's call it that. Um, we are going to go through uh, as, as, the, uh, as many uh, of, the, of the receipts that I have been able to find. We're going to discuss it, and then we are going to wrap it off by reviewing I already watched this on stream uh, a couple of days ago. The uh, apology slash response video that Andrew Callahan recently released. Um, now, uh, uh, this is a pretty fucked up situation. Um, however, I want to say a couple of things before we get going. The first of which is, um, Despite there still being a lot of Andrew Callahan stands who are going about and defending Andrew Callahan, uh, disparaging the victims uh, uh, and and uh, other things like that, I have to say that by and large, I think that the online left has responded quite well to this. And in fact, I think that the online left does a pretty good job by and large of responding to uh, uh, situations like this. Um, and the reason I want to say this is because I want to point out that uh, being a leftist does not make you immune to doing bad things. And being a leftist does not mean that somebody is intentionally a or is, is a, uh, uh, intrinsically a good person. Uh, there are lots of ways that you can arrive on the left, and also some people just don't follow what they preach. They just they they outwardly believe one thing, and they inwardly behave a different way. Um, that said, I think that as a general space, uh, the the lefty sphere is so much better at dealing with these sorts of things than basically any other space that you can think of, specifically than the right, obviously, which is, you know, um, the things that we talk about because American politics is polarized into more or less two political sides, um, a broad political sides. Uh, <laughs> the right, uh, I want to compare the allegations that have come out against Andrew Callahan and the response to Andrew Callahan uh, versus the allegations that came out against Matt Gates and the right's response to Matt Gates. Matt Gates is still in a position of power. Matt Gates has suffered essentially no major consequences socially for his actions. Um, Matt Gates uh, was uh, was involved allegedly, uh, strongly allegedly, in the uh, sex trafficking of a minor and, and his Republican comrades more or less still embrace him uh, of course, there is some quipping. Of course, there is some insults. But Matt Gates is nonetheless in a position of power, and his compatriots in the right-wing MAGA movement uh, still support him. This cannot be said about Andrew Callahan. And Andrew Callahan, to my knowledge, at least there is no confirmed evidence. At least that I've seen. We may, I may stand corrected as we go through all of the evidence today. But as far as I know, has not been involved in any form of sex trafficking and has not been involved in any sort of uh, uh, sexual abuse of minors that I know of. Um, but the reaction to Andrew Callahan has been basically every person associated with him calling him out and taking his victims seriously, uh, which I think that's a victory. 
I think that's something that we should take note of and that we should be proud of. There is a lot of uh, conversations right now uh, going on about the left being bad in this way, the left being bad in that way, all of the problems with the left. And of course, the left, when it is used, is used as a incredibly broad boogeyman that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, however, to, 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 uh, to, to, to borrow the, the often opining of, about the left. I think this is something where we can look at the left and say, wow, the left did do a lot better. Uh, the, left, the left and leftism as a whole can never prevent bad things from happening in whole. Nothing can. There is nothing in the world that we don't, you know, we're not, no one, I, I should hope, is trying to build like a, uh, a, a minority report type uh, uh, world where there's like psychic pre-crime and all of that stuff like that. Uh, I should hope. Um, uh, you wouldn't be, a, uh, I wouldn't argue you're a leftist if you believe in that sort of thing. Uh, however, uh, what we can do is we can decide how uh, terrible things that happen are handled. And I have to say that all in all, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the fact that major content creators on the online left have really taken Andrew Callahan to, to task and also have been more than willing to give his victims, his alleged victims, a, uh, a, a platform from which to speak and to make their voice heard. Lady, uh, uh, oh, hey, hey, hi, Progressive. It's great to see you. Lady Kelgana says, it's very unfortunate to me that we've lost the potential good that Andrew Call Callahan could do. He really wasted his light and it's altogether just sad. That will happen. Sometimes uh, a person can be a very, very skilled at a certain type of work. Sometimes a person can even be artistically uh, and intellectually uh, uh, like, like, talented to an unbelievable degree um, and they're just a bad person. They're a bad person who can't be trusted with power uh, of any sort of type. Andrew Callahan, as we are going to see, um, seems to be one of those people, at least from what I can tell. And we're going to get in and we'll make our final judgments at the end, of course. But uh, Andrew, a lot of what we're going to see here is examples of Andrew Callahan using the small amount of, of fame that he has which I say small because he's not like a Hollywood celebrity, but he does have a lot of fame and he has a lot of fame, especially along the left. And he seems to be willing to use that to uh, do harm to others for his own personal gain. Uh, AJ20 says, do you think it's still okay to watch Andrew's work? Um, I, I, never, I never really think that like, um, refusing to enjoy to like refusing to enjoy good things that have been made even by a bad person is like a is like a I don't always think that's a good tactic like refusing to watch something because a bad person made it or whatever uh, I think there are times where boycotts etc can be very valuable to send a message but um but like there's a lot of bad people who make a lot of stuff and also most of these projects are not truly solo projects. Channel 5 is not a solo project. He might be the, you know, the sort of leading man and the face of the brand, but there's a lot of other good people working on it. Uh, if there's stuff that you can still enjoy, sure, enjoy it. However, I think you should enjoy it with the knowledge in your mind of exactly what type of person you're dealing with. Um, I know that I, I am like that with certain things. Um, there are certain problematic media that I quite enjoy, that I think is valuable even, uh, that I think is that I would even recommend to people. I mean, hell, um, I think for, for an example that's not quite the same, but, but is similar, um, I think Stanley Kubrick's work is fantastic. I will watch Stanley Kubrick's movies, even though there is no doubt in my mind that Stanley Kubrick was an abuser, that he abused his his crew, that he just grossly abused his actors. Like, I mean, mentally um, and psychologically severely, severely injured the people that he worked with. Um, the way that he treated people was absolutely horrible. And nonetheless, I think that his work is not just, is not just good, but also valuable to film as a whole. Um, I just don't buy into the idea that you have to be an abusive person to be a good person. It just sometimes happens that way. Oh, Alfred Hitchcock was even worse. Alfred Hitchcock, um, Alfred Hitchcock one time um, actually uh, like tortured one of his crewmates 
um, one or one of his crew members. Uh, he had a crew member who uh, had a drinking problem, and uh, he got that guy extra drunk, and then he chained him up in the basement of the uh, of this of a studio set and left him there overnight. And when the crew came in in the morning, this this crew member who had been drunk had vomited and shit all over himself because he literally could not escape. He had been chained up while drunk by Alfred Hitchcock. It's actually one of the most insane things. Um, uh, you know, uh, one of the most insane things I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, he's a terrible person. And yet, his films are nonetheless valuable and incredibly useful uh, and, uh, and educational, in fact. Um, yeah, it's really, really bad. Um, yeah, people are bringing up all kinds of examples, of course. So, I have been doing a bunch of research for this Andrew Callahan... Um, uh, this Andrew Callahan segment and uh, as far as I can tell the most useful uh, sort of jumping off point is going to be uh, this thread right here so this is a thread uh, let me put the text back up Andrew Callahan the full story here we go uh, this is a, a mega thread that has been going for almost two weeks now um, on on the Channel 5 subreddit. And I have to give credit to the people who put this together because uh, there's basically no other uh, single place that I've been able to find that does such a good job of putting them all together in one place. You will now see just how much they've put together here. Now there is quite a uh, there is quite a wide variety of things that we're going to be going over here, and we're going to be hopping over to other things from this thread. But I wanted to let you know that this is what we're going to be jumping off of uh, for the most part. Uh, if you in chat are aware of something that is not in this thread that I may have missed, please feel free to bring it up and, and ping me in my chat as we go through this. I will try to review it to the best of my ability. Um, other than that, let's get started, okay? Oh, actually, I should say this. Um, I am not going to be doing my typical promos and stuff like that uh, throughout this section. So uh, I'll do this before we get into the heart of it. If you are enjoying the video, just press like on the vid. That's all I need. I'm not going to be asking for donos or anything like that during this segment. I'm going to be focusing on this. Uh, and also, I will most likely be a little bit less uh, immediately reactive to chat. So I apologize about that um, about that portion. Um, but this is a pretty important topic, so I want to make sure that we're able to get through it. Okay, so the first story that we are going to be diving into here is the story of a of a woman named Caroline. Okay. Uh, uh, and um, Caroline is the is the person who uh, basically, as as far as uh, as far as this particular chapter goes, ignited the series of al allegations against uh, Andrew Callahan. And one thing I want to talk about with this is that because um, there's going to be a lot of people watching this, uh, this is a very common thing to happen. Um, uh, when there is someone in power, uh, it, 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 is a, it is very difficult to actually sort of come out and tell your story if you were harmed by that person. The best example of this, of course, is the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement, um, uh, which focused initially on um, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Harvey Weinstein was an incredibly, incredibly a powerful producer in Hollywood, one of the uh, richest people in Hollywood, uh, who abused a lot of women. A lot of women. I mean, we're talking just years of this. And while people did come out um, at various points, many of them were completely buried and had their careers destroyed. Um, and their stories ended up, didn't always, didn't always end up catching um, any sort of uh, mainstream uh, eyes and this happens a lot um, it's actually surprising how long a lot of people can keep these stories under wraps um, uh, when they're in a position of power or when they have a lot of influence so what you end up seeing sometimes is that when one person gets an allegation 
uh, that manages to reach mainstream attention, or at least manages to uh, to gain a lot of attention, that you will see other people come out in the wake of that, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, this is uh, this is called emboldening. Um, if you uh, if you see someone standing up for themselves, uh, you are much more likely to be willing to stand up for yourself, uh, even if. Uh, the consequences will still be the same. And the reason for that is because there is the there is an understanding that you will be seen, that you won't be alone, even if there's repercussion and retaliation, um, then, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that there are other people there no, means that you won't be alone in receiving that, in, in dealing with that retaliation or whatever. Uh, some people, uh, uh, let's say, those who are more charitable or perhaps even defenders of Andrew Callahan or other similar abusers will say that it's a bandwagon. But this is not true. It is not charitable. It is not accurate in any way to say that people are bandwagoning on accusations that could end up destroying their lives. While it is true that, that false allegations exist, and in fact, false allegations do happen um, to all kinds of people, uh, the the fact that people come out in, in like one after the other when there's when there's one person whose whose call out reaches a level of of strength is not evidence of false accusations not even close and i wanted to make sure that i got this out of the way uh at this moment because we're going to see that the dates on these are all very close they all happen in rapid succession um yeah so uh so yeah I just wanted to make sure that people who are coming into that understand what I'm talking about and, and my rationale on this. Um, it is very common for this to happen, and it does not, uh, a number of, of allegations coming out in close proximity does not in any way uh, uh, indicate uh, a lack of trustworthiness of those, of those allegations. So, let's continue. Caroline's story. On January 5th, TikTok user Cornbread Acerole uh, uh, real named Caroline, posted a TikTok accusing Andrew of sexual coercion. In a later Rolling Stones interview, she states that she first met him at a dive bar called The Benz in St. Petersburg, Florida, and came up to him as a fan. Uh, at, the same, at the time, he was with a woman who appeared to be his girlfriend. After DMing each other a few months later, March 2021, the two agreed to meet up again at the same bar. She assumed the meeting would not be sexual, as she thought he had a girlfriend. She says once at the bar, however, she says that once at the bar, however, the vibes changed with him seeming, um, seemingly trying to impress her. He bought her lots of drinks and tipped a server heavily saying, did you see that I tipped him $100? She also later felt as if Andrew had been trying to get her overtly drunk. Now, uh, this is, this is the first one that a lot of people saw. I'm going to grab the video here real quick. Um, hold on. I have it over here. Let me bring up the video. We're going to watch the direct the direct story being told by uh, Caroline. I uh, just need to grab it real quick here. Uh, anyway, we'll continue here with this, and then we'll get back to it. We'll watch the actual whole thing. My apologies. Uh, so, uh, yes. So, did you see that I tipped him $100? She also later felt as if Andrew had been trying to get her overly, overtly drunk, specifically recalling that he bought her a lot of tequila. She says at the bar that he asked to kiss her, and she politely refused. At some point in the bar, Andrew states he had a falling out with his crew members and he needed a place to stay for the night. Now, this right here is going to be something that you're going to hear a lot uh, throughout this uh, entire event. The sort of, I have an, I need, there's an excuse, a pressing excuse that needs me, that like, that requires that I need a place to stay. Now, um, people looking at this, uh, on the surface, that might not seem like uh, like like such a major. Um, <laughs> it doesn't. It might not seem like such a major thing. Uh, however, um, it's a a a, a very core uh, manipulation tactic. Um, people are generally good. Okay, like that's just like people are generally pretty helpful. Not everybody, but a lot of people, the average person is is generally amicable and they don't want to see other people suffer, especially people that they have familiarity with. And so something like this where it's like, "Oh, oh crap, something really bad just happened to me. Can you give me a place to can I um can I stay at your place cuz I don't have a place to stay." You're put in a position 
um, you're not just being asked to, um, you're not just being asked for something. It's not like, hey, can you give me a ride around the corner? Hey, can I borrow $5 from you? You're being asked for something for which there is a large repercussion for that person. For you, uh, having somebody stay over is an inconvenience, but for them, they might not have a place to sleep that night, which is pretty, you know, which is a pretty hard thing to do to somebody. A lot of people are going to feel some level of pressure from that sort of thing because of the stakes, um, because you're saying, oh, well, I'm not gonna have anywhere to stay. Um, and uh, uh, this, is, this is one of those things that like, that makes it hard for people who've dealt with manipulation to like resume a normal social, uh, social I interactions with people because Sometimes people really do have a falling out with their with their group of people and they really do need a place to stay. So we assume often that people are acting in good faith. Does that make sense? Anyway, uh, I'm actually gonna read the rest of this from the article itself since uh, that's actually uh, a little bit better in my opinion. So here we go. When Charlotte was 18, she matched with a then 19-year-old man named Andrew Callahan on Tinder. The now 24-year-old, who requested a pseudonym to, pr pr uh, to uh, protect her privacy, was familiar with Callahan, uh, as, they had, uh, as they had attended neighboring high schools in the Seattle area. Though Callahan would later become well-known as the host of the popular YouTube channel All Gas, No Breaks, and Channel 5, as well as the filmmaker behind This Place Rules. There's the name of it. Uh, at the time, she knew of him as a goofy, aspiring rapper who went by the name Trek God. The view I had of him was like, haha, look at this dude, she tells Rolling, uh, Rolling Stone. But in 2016, she agreed to go out to coffee, both of them returning to the apartment she was staying at to drink wine and watch a movie. Okay? What happened next, she said, was an abrupt shift of tone in the evening. Charlotte claims Callahan kissed her, then poured wine on her chest and licked it off. They were acts she, had, she said that she had consented to, even though she was somewhat uncomfortable. It wasn't until Callahan grew more persistent, placing her hand on his, placing her hand on his crotch, that Charlotte started saying no. He wasn't taking a simple no for an answer, and consequently, it turned into me trying to make up an array of excuses as to why I didn't want to have sex, she said. He kept insisting that I needed to get him off because I was giving him blue balls by not having sex with him. Eventually, Charlotte says, Callahan got the message. The two never spoke again, but she says the incident left her feeling violated and confused and incredibly disrespected. For the next few years, Charlotte watched with growing discomfort as Callahan's platform grew, first with all gas, no brakes, in which she traveled across the country in an RV interviewing various eccentric subcultural figures, then with his follow-up channel, Channel 5, which garnered more than 2.26 million subscribers, and last year's release of This Place Rules, which documents the events leading up to the January 6th Capitol insurrection. Over the years, Charlotte privately told people who shared Callahan's content on social media about the encounter, messaging one friend in 2019 that Callahan had tried to make me do sexual things that I wanted to do that I didn't want to do, and another friend in 2020 that Callahan was really sexually inappropriate with me, according to screen grabs and screen recordings reviewed by the Rolling Stone. Okay, so this is something to note that's important. Um, when people uh, when a lot of people like to say, oh, allegations on the internet are, uh, are super fraudulent and you can't trust anything. And in fact, I can understand where people are coming from with that. As all of you know, um, basically every single internet public figure of any size or import is going to get accused of strange things. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is someone who has a provable history of telling other people about this event, uh, of, of coming out to other people, a, 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 a record of their in engagements with Andrew Callahan. This is, a, uh, an, this is an example of somebody who has been trying to have their story be heard for some time and has not been able to, and they have the receipts to prove it. This is what makes a, an allegation credible. Uh, uh, you know, when I say things like credible allegations or when I say things like verifiable allegations, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about. These art documents were poured over by the journalists at the Rolling Stone. They were looked through by tons of people. They were shared publicly as well, uh, eventually. 
Um, and while that doesn't necessarily uh, convict Andrew Callahan in a court of law, while it certain, while it doesn't necessarily even prove that he did the thing that he said, this makes this a credible allegation. And these things should be taken very seriously. Um, when people, uh, no one is a, uh, no person is like a mobile CSI unit, okay? Bad things happen to people all the time, and there are there can there are often no evidence of the bad thing that happened. In fact, really severe and heinous crimes are often occur, and no evidence is really left to record that it ever happened. But that doesn't mean that something bad didn't happen. And uh, and and that's why it's important to pay attention to. Um, to credible allegations. This is also, by the way, where the sort of adage that I'm sure many of you have heard um, over the years, uh, you know, believe victims. You've probably heard that that uh, that adage. Believe victims does not mean that you um, that you that any time someone says anything bad about somebody else, that you have to believe everything that they're saying. Believe victims is encouraging people to take seriously allegations that are brought against other other people not necessarily to jump to conclusions but just to actually listen because unfortunately people especially people with influence with with influence or some level of of social power are often able to mobilize uh uh, uh machines to suppress uh allegations machines to respond to them so it's important that we take serious allegations seriously, that people listen and, and understand with compassion and, and recognize that this is something that could be true. And this becomes especially true when the allegation, when credible allegations start piling up. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes there is no answer in a court of law. Often there is no answer in a court of law. Uh, often there is no way to uh, to prove or undo the crimes or the misbehavior of the past. But what we can do is we can take allegations, credible allegations seriously, and we can ensure that people who have a, a huge stack of credible allegations against them don't aren't put in positions of power where they can do it again. And also, uh, even if they're not like removed entirely uh, from from public life, uh, that at the very least, people are aware uh, so that they can keep their distance to the best of their ability. Does that make sense? Let's continue. Charlotte's ex-boyfriend, whom she told about the encounter with Callahan in 2016, tells Rolling Stone that Charlotte told him that Callahan was kind of aggressive. Then, while scrolling through TikTok, Charlotte saw another woman that had posted a video recounting a similar story about Callahan. It went from giving this 19-year-old goofy dude who doesn't understand consent the benefit of the doubt to, oh, this is a person who holds societal power and platform now, she says, explaining her decision to speak out. A popular, a popular creator with more than 150 million views on his channel, Callahan earned fame by posting videos of his deadpan interview with conspiracy theorists, far-right extremists, and members of other fringe subcultures. He expanded his profile with last December's release of This Place Rules, which has drawn acclaim for exposing the absurdities of the far-right in the United States specifically. Neither Callahan nor his reps responded to repeated requests for comment from Rolling Stone. Now, we're going to talk about that as this goes on. But in a statement to TMZ, a legal representative for the filmmaker said, Andrew is devastated that he is being accused of any type of physical or mental coercion against anyone. Conversations about pressure and consent are extremely important to Andrew, and, he want, and, and Andrew wants to have these conversations so that he can continue to learn and grow. Now, uh, some of you who watched me reviewing the uh, apology the other day uh, will note I think that this is very, very deliberately safe, controlled, and arguably legal language. I don't take these types of statements as very valuable, especially when there's no actual direct uh, addressing of what happened. He's not saying, he's not responding by saying, no, that didn't happen. He's not responding by saying, that's mischaracterized. He's just saying, the things that happened were regrettable. And I regret that people feel the way they do about the things that happened. It's very vague, intentionally vague, um, which 
like I said, is a is a is a way of using legal language to avoid getting in trouble in court later because you don't want to accidentally, uh, you know, if you're in that position, you don't want to accidentally confess to something that you that you are going to contest in court. Does that make sense? Bill Cosby is going on tour again. This is not enough. We will talk about that. Yes, we will talk about that. Um, anyway, on TikTok and on the Channel 5 subreddit, other women have come forward with their own alleged experiences with Callahan, alleging that they felt coerced or pressured into performing sexual acts with him. As previously reported by the Rolling Stone, one of these women, Dana, who goes by the handle Moldy Freckle, alleged in a video that Callahan had touched her inner thigh, kissed her neck, and attempted to put his hand down her pants while she was giving him a ride home. I told him to stop. I told him to get off me multiple times, he, she says in the video. He tried to put my hand down his pants and I was fighting against him during this telling him to please stop eventually she says Callahan did leave her car another woman a TikTok creator who goes by Caroline Elise this is the one we were just talking about before in the thread posted a video last week recounting her own experience with Callahan in May 2021 that received more than 189,000 views it was seeing Caroline's video that prompted Charlotte to come forward in an interview with Rolling Stone, Caroline says that she initially met Callahan at The Benz, a dive bar in St. Petersburg, Florida. She approached Callahan, who was with a woman who appeared to be his girlfriend, as a fan of his content. A few months later, they agreed to meet up when Callahan was in Miami and exchanged Instagram DMs. Screen grabs of which Caroline later posted to TikTok, along with a photo of her posing with Callahan. Callahan appears to be in distress, telling her that he had a, had a falling out with a crew member, she says, and asks if she, he could stay at her place, which she agreed to. So now we're back up. We've caught back up to the point where we were before. You see what I mean? That there is a false sense of urgency being created here. Ah, I've fallen out with my with my crewmate. I won't, I'm gonna have to sleep on the streets. Can you please help me? Can you please help me? But they don't actually care about having a place to stay. They're aiming at something else. It's a manipulation tactic that works because people assume the best in others. And this ties in with what I'm saying about why it's important to believe victims. Because we build our ideas of other people off of what we know about them. And if there's no, if, if, if somebody has a string of credible allegations against them, you might be more likely to say no to them coming to your house if you know those things. You might be more likely to be immune to the manipulation attempt that could put you into a dangerous position. Do you see how these are coming, how these connect together? Why it's important to listen to people, why it's important to take uh, credible allegations seriously? Because it's not, a lot of people are very legal minded. They focus very much on the, on the courts and on the convictions and on the going to jail and all this, but that doesn't happen most of the time, unfortunately, uh, in, 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 especially in sex crimes. Um, sex crimes are, uh, most of them go unpunished, most of them go unknown. Um, and protecting people is about making sure that information is available and also that information is credible and well, well evidenced. Let's continue. Caroline says that because she had met Callahan while he was with another woman, she did not initially think that the meeting would was romantic. When they met up again at the same bar a few months later in March 2021, however, the vibes shifted. He was buying me drinks to try and impress me. People who wouldn't have talked to me at the bar were kissing my ass. Do you see? That's the entourage. That's the effect of an entourage. If you have a bunch of people around you who are agreeing with you, they 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 gas you up. You know, they get you all ch harp char charged up, and then you know the person can go right in, right? Right? Their friends are softening you up, and then they can they can lure you in with that. At the bar, she says that Callahan tried to kiss her, and she and she says she politely turned him down. When they ended up going back to her place, Caroline says, 
Callahan became persistent, allegedly badgering her for sex. He was very pushy and not taking no for an answer, she says. I was like, no, I'm not feeling it. Eventually, she relented, she says, and was coerced into various sexual acts. I was sexually assaulted when I was 14 by someone else. I fought back hard against that person. I pushed that person off of me, she says. I think that in that moment, that's why I didn't fight Callahan off of me as much as I could have. And I tried to turn him down politely until he begged and begged, and I finally let him touch me. When Carolyn woke up at 4 a.m. having a full-blown panic attack, she kicked Callahan out of her apartment a few hours later. For the next few months, she says she blamed herself for the encounter and felt guilty for inviting him over. I internalized a lot of disgust and anger at the situation, she says, adding that her mother bought her a new comforter because she didn't want to sleep in her own bed afterwards. Now, this is something that I want to talk about as well, which is um, why don't people fight back? Uh, if you have never been in a situation like this, which I hope that you haven't, a lot of people uh, like to imagine that if they were being sexually assaulted or if they were being raped, that they would fight back immediately. But the truth is that in that that survival isn't always about immediately fighting back. And in fact, um, especially if you are physically overpowered or socially overpowered, uh, fighting back can actually put you in more danger. And that sucks, but it's simply true. People don't, um, you know, it's not like like people choose to, to, to like not fight back. They're trying to survive. Um, it's actually remarkably common, as it turns out, that if uh, it, that that people progress, you know, that like assaulters and rapists progress. They they first they try to get it, and if you say no, then they keep pushing, and if you keep saying no, then they keep pushing harder, and then if you re if you physically refuse, then they physically impose, and as it turns out, sometimes the violence can literally be deadly. Uh, it can often be deadly, or it can be violent such to the degree that it's incredibly painful, and people make the decision that they would rather uh, they would rather give in and save themselves from physical from physical pain, and instead suffer emotional um, or lesser physical pain. Um, this is not really a hard thing um, to to understand if you put yourself in that place. Um, but a lot of people sort of instinctively, uh, unfortunately, it's an this is what we talk about when we talk about rape culture. We're talking, when we talk about a culture that says, well, you didn't fight back, that means you couldn't have had your consent violated. This is what we talk, that's what we mean when we say, when people say things like rape culture. It's a culture that ultimately supports violating people's consent, that supports uh, breaking people down people's barriers, pressuring them, threatening them implicitly or explicitly. Um, so I just wanted to, to make sure that we touched on that so that people who are watching who maybe haven't heard these terms or maybe aren't familiar with these concepts can take those home and think on them, okay? Um, this level of manipulation is nothing short of, of a violation of consent. And another thing that we're going to encounter uh, throughout this is that we're going to encounter um, the, we're going to observe the line between rape and sexual assault. Ethically, there is not much of a difference between rape and sexual assault. To me, I believe that from an ethical perspective, there is not really much of a difference in most cases. Um, if you are uh, grabbing someone's body, with you know, if you are are taking someone and touching them against their will, uh, if you are uh, you know uh, molesting them, that, in my opinion, is the same thing ethically as rape but but a lot of times people get very cagey about these definitions where you know for example rape is has often in the past been uh been defined as only penetration you know forcible penetration and nothing else but uh as far as like as far as the actual acts are concerned i do not think um uh, I, I, I don't think that, that there is any significant difference between, uh, between uh, somebody who is going all the way to penetrative sex and somebody who is aggressively molesting somebody else. I think that these are, as far as the actual act is concerned, very, very similar. Um, I just want people to understand uh, 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 that there is sometimes there is, uh, 
let's just say there was bad faith play with these words. Oh, he's not a rapist. He just, you know, forced himself on somebody else and touched their body over and over again. Um, I don't care about that distinction. And um, I just want that to be on the table because what we're talking about here for the most part is not going to be legal distinctions. We are going to be talking about moral and ethical distinctions. Mix Dizzy says, the word rape itself comes from a Latin word that means to seize. And before it had a sexual meaning, it meant to grab someone or kidnap them and carry them off as plunder. Yes. Yes. So let's continue. A friend of Caroline's who asked not to be named told Rolling Stone that Caroline had shared the details of the encounter with her shortly afterwards. In the spring of 2021, the friend posted about Callahan on Instagram accusing him of sexual assault and urging people to unfollow him. The Instagram story was intended as a warning to other women in the area, she tells Rolling Stone, although she did not name Caroline directly. Caroline's boyfriend also confirmed that Caroline had told him about Callahan in the spring of 2021, a few months after that night in her home. So Caroline, the 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 person whose TikTok video sort of in, uh, ignited all of this, um, is is you know, is somebody who now has multiple uh, people who have signed off on, on her version of the story. They have said, yes, I was told about this here, and they've been able to, many of them have been able to prove that she talked to them about it. So again, when I say a credible allegation, this is the type of stuff I'm talking about. It's not just uh, her own story. She has people who she's told this story to before who can say, I was told this story in 2021. This isn't coming out of nowhere. Okay, here we go. I found the actual TikTok. We're gonna watch the TikTok now. This is this is where we're gonna watch the actual TikTok itself. This All right, video, let's do this. And I'm shaking because. So this is Caroline, the person who was interviewed by Rolling Stone, for whom all of these, uh, all of the things that we've been discussing so far, uh, has been verified by major journalistic out outlets. Uh, so this is about as credible of an allegation as you can possibly get. Let's go. I never in a million years thought that I would be making this video and I'm shaking because I've tried a couple different times and haven't been able to get my point across, but um, I don't like seeing abusers get platforms. And my abuser, Andrew Callahan, also known as All Gas No Breaks, Channel 5, and whatever his new HBO show's called, I forget, um, has been plastered all over my news feed, and I've tried to come to him person to person and try to get him to take accountability for what he did, but his version of what happened the night that he assaulted me is so skewed. So I will tell you that he did eventually get consent. And that's the main point is that he eventually got consent because he wore me down. He told me he needed a place to stay for the night. He had some sort of falling out with one of his crew members or whatever. And I was very clear about the fact that we are not hooking up. He gets in my bed and wears me down to the point where I eventually do agree to do things that I wasn't proud of. And I wasn't proud of them and thought it was my fault for so long that I continued to be nice to him after the situation. He wouldn't leave my house the next morning. Um, and then as time went on and I processed things, I thought, you know what, just because eventually I said, okay, whatever, because I was trying to just get the whole night over with so that it could be morning so that he could leave. Um, it's, it doesn't discount the fact that I told him no. So, um, I told him no so many times prior to this. I said, I'm tired. I'm not really feeling it. I came up with any excuse that I possibly could to just get him off of me. And he still found a way to coerce me into things that I didn't want to do. And this is really hard for me to say. When someone is in your house, it is incredibly difficult to tell them no, especially if you are alone in your house, especially if you believe that person has intent to harm you. It can be incredibly difficult to tell them no. This person, Caroline, has been telling, according to her version of the story, she has been telling him no over and over and over again. Uh, and uh, he wouldn't take no for an answer. And of course, like I said, all of this starts with the setup of not being able to go back once you've made the decision. Ah, shit, I volunteered to let this guy stay at my house because I don't want him to have to sleep on the streets, but now I'm basically stuck in my house with this person. It's the middle of the night. There might not be anybody I can call for support. There might not be anybody who can come here to be with me. Let's continue. I never thought I would come forward, but it's even more hard to have to relive the trauma that I 
endured every single day by seeing this man as a social justice warrior, as someone who cares about human rights, get a platform. You shouldn't be supporting him. And at the end of the day, like I've told close friends of mine, I've tried coming out about this before. And he texted me saying that it basically ruined his life and that his life was over now because of things that I said. And other women have come forward to me. But this is my first time publicly talking about it on a platform like TikTok because I hope it gets traction. I hope people listen to me. I hope that if something similar has happened to you, that you know that that's not your fault. It wasn't my fault what happened to me just because I eventually caved. This is so hard to do, but I eventually, you know, I was really hoping that he would eventually take accountability, but he just texted me this skewed version of what he thought had happened. And in that moment, it wasn't. Now, this is another thing too, which is that him responding in real time to this, confirming that the event did happen, but then going with a completely other narrative, a narrative that is not, that, that no one else can attest to. She told people immediately what horrible things happened with Andrew Callahan. Um, he obviously would not. So he has no witnesses on his side because in his mind, he didn't do anything wrong and he's going to continue asserting this. But Caroline here, has clearly discussed this with other people immediately after the event happened. Um, her boyfriend, or her, her ex-boyfriend, uh, her, her friend who ended up talking about it publicly, um, both of these are people who can verify that right after the event happened, Caroline told them this version of the events. Fight or flight, it was freeze. I froze and I couldn't control my body anymore. Not to mention he got me really drunk that night. He was trying to buy me all kinds of the best kinds of tequila at the dive bar we were at. Um, and a lot of people don't believe me. I've got receipts, I've got photos of us, I've got text messages, but you shouldn't need that. You should believe me and you should stop supporting Andrew Callahan. Take away his platform. He doesn't deserve it. In regards to the whole Andrew Callahan situation, this is the last time that I'm gonna be talking about it. Um, a friend of mine te texted and asked if I was okay because she saw my post on Reddit. That wasn't me that posted on Reddit. I'm getting a lot of hate. Um, you guys, like, seem to need receipts. You know, um, someone speaking up about their story isn't enough, so I'm going to share with you um, some, I guess, like, evidence that I was with him that night. I didn't have a camera set up in my bedroom, so I don't know what to tell you. You're just going to have to take my word for it, and if you don't, that's okay. Um, this is the last time I'm ever going to talk about this. And I've made my TikTok private, so if anyone wants to sh share what I'm saying with the people on Reddit, feel free to do that, but I can't mentally handle this anymore. This was Andrew and I agreeing to hang out when he was in St. Pete. And again, at this point in time, just know that these screenshots and messages have been verified by the Rolling Stone at the very least, in addition to other newspapers that have picked this up. So just keep that in mind. Just just keep that in mind. We now have the knowledge that uh, that all this has been verified by, by people going and looking at them. These are not like faked. This is in her app that she was able to show these journalists. <laughs> This was us the night at the bar. Um, There's a picture of them together. Okay, there you go. That's gonna, that right there is gonna be what we call a, a pretty heavy uh, uh, piece of evidence that adds to the credibility of these claims. We went into the bathroom to take a photo because this bar, it's the bathroom has its own Instagram page and it's just something people do at that bar. Um, also, like I said many times before, I trusted him. Um, you know, and people are blaming me for trusting him, and I did, you know, and it is what it is. This is a comment um, from someone who I've been speaking with about what happened to her. This is a message I got um, about a year ago from someone who... I know it sounds she's to say, but you're very brave for even reaching out to people because that's very hard to do. That is true. It is very hard to reach out and talk to people about this. Um, and for a number of reasons. Uh, the first of which is, like I said, the aforementioned rape culture. Uh, uh, there is a very bad rape culture in the United States where basically uh, women are treated 
uh, generally women, but any rape victim, to be completely honest, is uh, treated as devalued or as like damaged goods for having gone through the thing. Uh, so people don't talk about it because they don't want to have the perception of being damaged goods. It's incredibly fucked up, but it's an incredibly common sentiment here in the United States. It's also wrong, very wrong. Let's continue. Said oh, sorry. Can I ask some people uh, I know if they would be willing to talk to you and I can give you them, them your Insta? Also, my friend has mutual friends with his camera guys, and I hear that he's basically sleeping with girls who looked very young and live with their parents. So 99% underage while on tour. I don't know. I I don't know about this particular uh, uh, thing. This one is a pretty major separate allegation I would be careful about. Um, looking very young is not a good thing, but nonetheless, uh, this seems to just be evidence of her connecting with other people. That Let's he continue. Uh, has no, been known to associate with underage girls. This is the story from the same person of her experience. You can pause to read any of this stuff. The situation that I was in was at a party probably three years ago. I thought that Andrew ha Callahan was cool at first and we had a pretty good conversation. Then we went into a room kind of isolated from everyone and he was really pressuring me to go to his house. I said no multiple times and he kept pushing and pushing. As you know, he's a very tall guy and I'm only 5'4". I was pretty drunk because obviously because we were at a party and I feel like he was blocking the doorway so that we were in there for a really long time. Luckily, my friend came to check on me. So you can, you're starting to get a picture that there are multiple people who have been verified at these parties or at these events with Andrew Callahan who have had these experiences where Andrew Callahan simply cannot take no for an answer. Uh, this is about how he was canceled on his uh, French Quarter confession show when he went to Loyola because of the same sorts of allegations. You can pause to read that just another. I just want to let you know I went to school with Andrew. He pulled the same shit with me and a friend of mine. He frequently Airbnb listed his place and did the I need somewhere to stay tactic, which feels very intentional. So this is other people saying that he was using this tactic, people who knew him, who uh, who were say that he was using the same tactic uh, in the past. Unfortunately, I hate to say this, but this type of tactic, like for the reasons I mentioned before, the manipulative power of those statements is an unfortunately common thing that some very, very ill-intentioned people do. And uh, somebody in chat said that it kind of ruins it for everyone, and it does. Uh, part of the problem with this type of manipulation is that manipulation only works because it's able to disguise itself as genuine intentions. People don't choose to be manipulated. You know what I mean? They're manipulated because they're being manipulated. They're being deceived. Let's continue. Another story. Um... He's got a list of you know, women who he gets to give them head, give him head. Um, another instance of sexual assault. I'm sorry you messaged him and he didn't do anything that's incredibly disappointing. We're listening to you in New Orleans and in Austin. My friend lived with him for a while and apparently uh, and he apparently sexually assaulted the other roommate who has been terrified to come forward. You're helping a lot of people sharing this, and I'm sorry some people are so thick in the head that they don't have compassion and can't educate themselves on consent. People out here really pretending to care about women until their favorite public figure violates a woman, and then it becomes inconvenient for them. I just think that the, the, a lot of these statements in here are just... True, truly in analyzing the situation. Unfortunately, uh, despite my praise of the overall general left response, uh, there can be no doubt about the fans of Andrew Callahan going to defense for him and a lot of other uh, people uh, going to defense for him, despite the fact that there are a, a, a large number of credible allegations at this point, which we are going through right now. So let's continue. And I'm keeping these people private and they've all consented to me sharing their stories. And I'm doing so because I've already put my face out there. I'm already getting all the hate. It is what it is at this point. There's another story. More people saying that they've heard about this before. Another story. Andrew Callahan and I are the same age. He went to a high school in Seattle near mine and at the same time as me. So I not, know a lot of the same people as him. He also frequented local kickbacks and spodies, basically parties with jungle juice in a park. And he was doing some rapping stuff back then. 
which we know that's true. So a lot of people knew of him. It's pretty common knowledge in Seattle social circles that he's committed sexual assaults. I don't know his victims personally, but I have friends who do, and to my knowledge, alcohol and coercion have been a pattern. He's basically, he's known to a lot of people as a predator. Also, you have my consent to share this. Now, this particular uh, tweet, or this particular message does not have a whole lot of supporting evidence. However, it can indicate where people can go look, where people can go ask. Um, and to be honest, there's not a whole lot of benefit that you gain from anonymously supporting somebody saying that Andrew Callahan sucks. You don't gain anything personally from that. Uh, this type of message to me comes across as someone who is genuinely concerned, someone who has heard this sort of thing a lot and doesn't want to see other people get hurt. Even if I will admit this does not, this particular one does not have a whole lot of supporting evidence to it. But it does point people to people who, it, it points us to groups, to areas where where journalists, such as the ones who work for uh, uh, the Rolling Stone, etc., can go to further verify these stories. Let's continue. My inbox is flooded with people saying that they are proud of me for speaking up because they're too scared to, so I'm sharing their stories for them. Um, this is absolutely taking a huge toll on my mental health. Um, I can see that a lot of you don't want to believe women when they come forward about things, and um, I've just got to say that says a lot about your personality and who you are. Um, I have no doubt that this woman has received a an an absolutely endless amount of uh of 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 harassment over this. I I I just know for a a fact that that's the case. Um, even mentioning subjects like this uh, uh often gets you an incredible amount of uh of negative uh of negative response. Okay, so let's see here. Here we go. We're going to continue from the article here just so we make sure that we get all the evidence that's been verified by Rolling Stone out in the air, okay? After the release of This Place Rules, Caroline recorded her TikTok video recounting her experience with Callahan because she says it was painful to see everyone praise him. That's what we just watched right there. Absolutely Productions, the company founded by Eric Wareheim and Tim Heidecker of comedy duo Tim and Eric, yeah, that Tim and Eric, eight and A24 produced This Place Rules. A rep for A24 did not respond to a request for comment. However, on Thursday, Tim Heidecker addressed the allegations against Callahan on his weekly podcast, Office Hours. It's been a very painful week for us. He said, adding that he and Wareheim have no professional relationship with Andrew at this time and no plans going forward to have any relationship with him. Tim Heidecker and Eric dropped Andrew Callahan, which is respectable. We believe these women who came forward and, of course, totally condemn the type of behavior that Andrew is being accused of, he says. In their statement to TMZ, Callahan's lawyer alleged that one of the accusers had attempted to extort Callahan. While every dynamic is open to interpretation and proper communication is critical from those involved, repeated requests for money should not be a part of the conversation, the lawyer said. TMZ further reported that a source with direct knowledge had suggested it was Caroline who had asked Callahan for money. Caroline denies the claim. He's trying to act like I blackmailed him when I really was just trying to remind him that I'm still here and still suffering, she says. Texts were provided to the Rolling Stone show that Caroline requested that Andrew Callahan help contribute to the massive amounts of therapy bills I have accrued due to the night you coerced me and the resulting trauma before including her Venmo. So that's a pretty dirty tactic uh, from Andrew Callahan's lawyer team and Andrew Callahan himself claiming that you were being blackmailed because somebody who has been telling you that you hurt them for a long period of time says that you should help pay for the therapy bills. That is not extortion and that is not blackmail. That is just not what that is. And for them to make that allegation is is hilarious uh, and also disgusting. Let's continue. Caroline says that while she has been attacked online by many of his fans who have questioned her story, she has also received a lot of uh, messages of support, including from some women who have alleged similar experiences with Callahan, including Charlotte, which was the first person that we read about in this story. 
Uh, for her part, Charlotte says that she would not have come forward at all had Callahan not amassed such a tremendous platform or built his following on seemingly progressive bona fides. The blurred lines of their encounter also contributed to her decision to largely stay quiet until now. This is something that has bugged me for years. It has left me with a bad taste in my mouth, but there has never been a re reason to come out and announce this guy had harassed me because quite frankly, every woman I know has had an experience like this, she says, which is very bleak, but that's the world that we live in. It wasn't until seeing Caroline's video, that's this one that we just watched, the, 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 this, this, this lady right here, um, until seeing Caroline's video, as well as a video made by other creators alleging that Callahan had ignored their boundaries, that Charlotte realized this person is making content with the intention of making change and justice and is seemingly using their societal power to get laid. And I think that's really nasty. So Charlotte is somebody whose story happened years ago and she told other people about it, but never made a public call, only made it public once she realized that there was a pattern here. Um, I think that speaks very strongly to Charlotte. Um, and I think that it's pretty gross that people would try to imply that, you know, Charlotte was trying to get something from this when she's been sitting on the story and telling only her personal, uh, and uh, her personal friends and people who she thinks might be in danger and only came forward once she realized there were other people who had been hurt by him in the same way. So, by the way, this is another thing, okay? Uh, I wanted to note this. This is written in the uh, in the Reddit thread, which we are going to be, like I said, revisiting multiple times. Carolyn would reply to, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the text that has Caroline's Venmo and asks Andrew to help pay for her costly therapy bills. Carolyn's friend stresses that this is the only text Caroline ever sent to Andrew requesting any money, and there is not multiple, as Andrew's team claims. Now notice, I want you to notice something, which is that Andrew's team has not presented these texts. Um, Caroline's, Caroline, who does not have a lawyer team, has presented these texts. She gave these texts directly, uh, or, or sorry, I should say this text, a single text in which she made reference to her therapy bills to uh, to Rolling Stone. There is no evidence that, that multiple texts exist. So Andrew Callahan's team is simply trying, I, I, I can't help but say, unless they are withholding evidence from the public eye, which would be a very strange decision to do, I should, I should note, um, especially given that Caroline is not uh, suing. That's another thing to keep in mind here. Caroline is not suing Andrew Callahan. Caroline simply wants to stop people from getting hurt. Um, so his team has no reason not to release these texts if she was so-called blackmailing him. She's not suing. So why would they not release them? And the answer to me seems quite obvious that it seems like it's an attempt to muddy the waters and to, dis and to discredit Caroline as a victim which I think is very disgusting, personally. So, uh, one moment here. I gotta bring up a couple other things. See here. This is the, let me get this up real quick. Hold on, uh, oops, oh, damn it. No. Okay, hold on. Do you get the actual uh, posted video on TikTok? Okay, that's where I need to search it. Here we go. All right, so this is the story from Moldy Freckle. This is the second person who came forward. Okay, so we're going to talk about this real quick and we're going to watch the TikTok. On January 7th, two days after Caroline's story, TikTok user Moldy Freckle, real named Dana, posted a video on TikTok. Her story starts on January 29th, 2019. Here you have the a screenshot of the message from of her messages with Andrew Callahan on January 19th, 2019, or January, uh, sorry, what's the date? January 29th, 2019. Um, we could fuh sometime. Sorry, that was the best way for me to slide into your DMs. Sure, you're cute. So they started talking, okay? Flirting, fine, okay? Now let's hear what she has to say. We're gonna listen to her story right now. This is Dana, AKA uh, uh, Moldy Freckle. 
Okay, so as I said in my Hello, last Ico. TikTok, Good to see you. Um, I'm going to be talking about what happened between me and Andrew Callahan. Um, but I want to start off by saying that I wouldn't have been able to do this um, without Caroline posting that TikTok first, honestly. Again, Caroline was the one we just watched previously, the first one who uh, managed to get any sort of major attention on it. She gave me the opportunity to feel comfortable enough to actually show my face and talk to a bunch of strangers online about something very personal um, that's happened to me. Um, I had actually posted about it publicly about um you know what happened between me and andrew the day before caroline posted her TikTok, um because i didn't really know where else to talk about it that would reach you know more people than just my close friends i don't have a really big following on any social media um, I keep a lot of accounts private because of my professional life. And, um, yeah, but I just want to, you know, say thank you to Caroline first off. Uh, she was, you know, th there was positive, supportive comments on her post. And, you know, then someone took her post and posted on Reddit. And then everyone was having a heyday with it. Um... You know. As Somniostatic in chat points out, uh, as we can see over and over again with all of these victims, they do put their own jobs and their own lives at risk by coming out. Um, the narrative that you can like you can like gain clout or make money from from like coming out with an allegation like this is so false. It's not even it's not even funny. It is. Uh, not something that any of these people do. Uh, as we discovered just a few minutes ago because of the broken links, um, most of these people have privated their accounts entirely. They have not gained anything from any of this. Uh, they have only been uh, been sort of run over with harassment and then forced to hide. This is a this is a an attempt to prevent harm, not an attempt to gain anything. And the, the, the evidence just shows that no one is gaining anything from any of this. Uh, yeah. So, let's continue. Saying hurtful things and not believing her, which really hurts. And I know that really hurt her. Um, and so, I'm not gonna let someone else go through this alone like if y'all want to should talk about somebody you can do it about me you can say mean shit to me i really don't care what you have to say because i i'm just saying the truth right now and uh, i don't care what you believe but i want um i want <laughs> you know, other women who he's affected to feel comfortable about talking about it. Um, I'm not saying they have to talk about it, but um, to realize that, you know, this isn't your fault, this isn't an isolated event. Um, this is a pattern that this guy has and your feelings are valid and what, what, whatever happened to you is valid. Now, the main thing is that, you know, people are like, where's the evidence? Where's the proof? Um, you know, with sexual assault and things like that, it's kind of hard to provide proof unless, like, you get raped and go to the emergency room and get a rape kit right after. Um, I don't know why y'all think that we would have receipts for experiences. Um, but anyways, here I am. Backing up my girl Caroline because, uh, you know, it, it's already a really difficult thing to talk about. And, you know, some people are like, well, why are you just now coming out with this that he has a HBO Max special? So I will say personally, um, 
I ig ignored him, blocked him from my life, ignored everything that he was doing after um, what occurred to me. Um, and this was, I'm gonna estimate about three years ago. Um, this is when he was living in New Orleans. Um, anyways, the thing is, this is not the worst thing that has happened to me. I've experienced worse. Most women experience um, some type of sexual abuse or assault in their lifetime more than once. I'm just going to take a moment to pause and say, I want you to, I want you all to understand how fucking real that is. Um, not only uh, has basically every every person in in this that we've that we've talked about so far has mentioned that um th three different people who've been involved in this have mentioned that fact um but i like as somebody who you know i'm i'm 32 uh i i've met a lot of people in my life and i've met a lot of women in my life it is um horrifyingly common sexual assault co coercion Violation of consent is horrifically common. It is so unbelievably common. It hurts so much. And I need you guys to understand that this is not like, um, that when people talk about rape culture and people talk about rampant misogyny and people talk about, um, you know, in, you know, people having entitlement to others' bodies, um, this is not a thing of the past. This is a right now thing. This is a thing that is going on every single day and it has to be fought against harder. We have not successfully uh, defeated this. We have only managed to make a small dent in the never ending um, violation uh, of, of consent that is going on in our culture right now. So please, um, yeah, please take it seriously and seriously think on it because, uh, yeah. Uh, Killjoy says, uh, rape and sexual assault is the number one c crime committed in the military between fellow servicemen and, fe and, and women. Yes. Uh, un unfortunately, um, that's something that I know remarkably personally. Um, it is rape and sexual assault is unbelievably common in the in the military in the U.S. military. It is horrible, um, and yeah. Let's continue. Let's continue. Um, so my previous coping mechanism for that was to ignore them, forget about it, never think about it again. It kind of fades away in your memory. Um, I tried to do that with Andrew. I don't even know what Channel 5 is. Um, I knew him first from Quarter Confessions. Um, but yeah, I would see like a snippet of a video of him or something and I would immediately just like scroll away from it. Um, so I actually had no idea how popular he was becoming. But when I went on my HBO Max to put on fucking the new Sex in the City season, which sucks, by the way, um, but that's why it's great. Um, you know, fucking this dude's creepy ass face or animated face is on my TV. Like, this dude has a fucking HBO Max special? Nah. I can no longer ignore it, and um, I'm not gonna fucking put up with this. Anyways, I have a lot to say, and I have a whole story, but um, I don't want this to be dragged out for too long because I want people to pay attention to what I'm saying. So um, I'm just gonna, in brief, say that I had hooked up with Andrew previously. Um, he creeped me out, made me feel weird, was mean, demanding. Um, he hit me up again after this time uh, to hang out with me again. And I said, no, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. I don't want to sleep with you ever again. 
um, asked me why. I told him why he invited me to go out to dinner so he could apologize. So Holy fucking shit, that is so manipulative. To get told no, to get told to have like a a a a a failed connection, and then to go well, let me apologize to you, let me make it right to you, and then use that as an angle. That is so disgustingly manipulative. That is so sickeningly bad. Using a an apology as a pretense. By the way, that's the type of behavior that indicates that this is calculated, and that you should never believe that he just doesn't know what he's doing. That this is that this is obviously calculated to be able to use a an apology as a false pretense to try and have sex with somebody desperately, uh, which we're going to see the full level of what happened here is so disgusting. It is it is a a, a next level disgusting manipulation tactic. So I went to this dinner because honestly I don't care about an apology because I wouldn't believe it anyways. But I was like, free food, mm, whatever, you know? Turns out he invites me to a really shitty diner. Like, I've never been to a diner this shitty. This is besides the point, but I'm just saying. Like, what the fuck? It's not that hard. Pooch Patrol Pooch says, are we talking about Andrew? Yes, we are. We are talking about Andrew Callahan. Yes. To fuck up breakfast food. Um. Anyways, so... I go to the dinner, he's not really talking to me, and then I'm like, so did you have something you wanted to say? And he's like, oh yeah, do you want to have sex in your car after this? And I was like, no, I don't. Is there anything else you want to say? Um, and she was like, Oh, yeah, sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable. Are you joking? You really don't want to have sex in your car after this? And he asked that, like, probably five so more disgusting. times. So disgusting. Like, you're joking, right? Like, you, do, you want to have sex in your car after this, right? And I was like, no. So, um, I told him I would take him home because he lived close by, but that I did not want to have sex in my car at all. I did not want to have sex with him again, ever. Um, and after we got to my car, he started advancing towards me, um, started touching my inner thigh. Um, and pulled me forward and started kissing my neck. Um, so I really couldn't move out of the position. Um, he was holding me like tightly. And um, he proceeded to put his hand down my pants. I told him to stop. I told him to get off of me multiple times. Um, he tried to put my hand down his pants and I was, you know, fighting against him during this, told him to please stop. Um, and he said, um, you could at least suck my dick. And I said, no, I don't want to do that get out of my car. At that point, it was, I'm not taking you home anymore. Get the fuck out of my car. And he just got mad, really. He was mad um, that I would even say that. But at the same time, he was laughing at me um, and continued to try to kiss me and was like, are you serious? Come on, come on. Um yeah it was not fun so i told him to get out of my car again he wouldn't get out and he said you could at least take me home so i realized at this point i would not be able to physically push him out of my car 
So I started driving. See? You see the situations that you can find yourself in? Uh, also, notice that, that there is, a, uh, that there is a, a specific line that's being fought. Oh, I'm go you're going to either have to do what I want you to do, or you're going to have to call the cops, which... Look, dealing with the cops is a very, very stressful event, and there's a good chance the cops show up and say, hey, leave her alone, and then do nothing else. Or they don't even help. They just say, what the hell's going on here? Uh, or you have to run out of your car and go scream for help from a random bystander. That's a horrible event, a horrible situation to be in. Physically incapable of getting rid of somebody and given only options that are incredibly extreme and very humiliating. Wild. Jenkins Donut says, I was hoping to see your stream about this. I'm glad that I've tuned in. Funny how the more factual evidence pops up, the worse it looks for Andrew. Gee, I wonder why. Yeah, it's pretty fucking bad. Hey, Merrick, good to see you. We're going over some pretty heavy shit right now. I'm happy to see that you're here. Hope you're doing well. Killjoy points out, it gets even worse when the cops take the man side of the story, and, and in fact, it's crazy how often that happens. Yeah, cops are not a, uh, as we all know, uh, on this channel, uh, cops do not necessarily uh, help you. That's not their job. Quickly and erratically down the road, I pulled into a busier street and I stopped abruptly thinking, you know, like maybe someone will realize something is wrong or if someone is honking at me, like he'll feel uncomfortable and want to leave the car. But I guess it did make him uncomfortable that I did that and I told him to get the fuck out of my car. Um, and he was like, can I at least get a kiss goodbye? And I said, fuck that is no. That is disgusting. Get the fuck out. He left. Um, never spoke to him or saw him again. Have it. So those are the allegations from Dana. Um, a, a highly detailed story with a... Uh, and again, this is one of the ones... Uh, keep in mind that Andrew Callahan himself has not denied uh, uh, has not denied that these events occurred. He's only denied the character of these events, um, all of the ones that we're watching so far. In fact, Ethan Klein, um, which we will be watching this clip in just a little bit, Ethan Klein confirmed that in a private conversation between him and Andrew Callahan, Andrew Callahan did indeed uh, uh, confirm that relationships did occur with all of these people who were accusing him, uh, but that he contested the character of them. And to me, it beggars belief that you would have three highly detailed stories, uh, people who then were subjected to an incredible amount of harassment, uh, not telling the truth. Sorry, that's just nonsensical. These are highly evidenced stories. These are uh, extremely personal. These are very humiliating to have to tell in public. Um, but yes. So, uh, so... Down here, what we're going to see is uh, these. We have now heard the stories of Caroline. Uh, we have heard the story of Charlotte, and we have heard the story of Dana. Now, in here, we have heard some of these already. This is the 2021 allegations. This is the stuff that was from Caroline's friend. Um, so, this is the 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 pictures of the story uh, that was. This was now confirmed. We now have evidence that this uh, 2021. Uh, call out post was made by a friend of Caroline, the 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 person whose TikTok we watched first, um, and this is the actual the record of of when it was posted. This was posted uh, saying he knowingly sexually assaulted my friend and got away with it. Please stop stop supporting his dumb ass and unfollow him. This has now been confirmed by both journalists and by Caroline herself to have been her friend attempting to warn people from her account. Okay. In addition, um, in 2020, there was another set of allegations. In 2020, a woman revealed that Andrew attempted to sexually prey on one of her friends. Just more context on the last post. I hung out with all gas, no breaks last night as he was in Nashville and he was trying so hard to fuck my drunk friend who made it clear that she said no. Manipulative ass motherfucker who is using his platform to get girls to sleep with him. He's currently touring and living in an RV, so watch out if he comes to your city. 
Notice that this has been verified as having been posted in 2020. This is a random Instagram person just warning people, like not, they weren't saying I didn't have anything. They were saying, hey, my friend was drunk and this motherfucker was trying to fuck them uh, against her will. Like that is wild. That is absolutely wild. So this next one is called the Navy story. We're gonna read through this one real quick and we're gonna look at some of the evidence here. This allegation was posted on January 7th to the subreddit, that's this subreddit. This was posted here originally and takes place in New Orleans during 2017. So you can actually see, I believe this is the original post right here. Uh, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is the, the original post that you can see that was made here. Um, a friend of Dana's came forward and spoke about his own partner's interaction with Andrew while she was 17 in college, said partner being the woman who sent the 2020 DM. She, she describes how Andrew DM'd her to hang out one day and she agreed but brought friends. He took them to a local abandoned Navy base, which it apparently looks like this is a real, yeah, this is a real location that was talked about. A, the, a, the Bywater Abandoned Naval Base. So this is a person ta talking about a real place that Andrew has been confirmed to have gone, okay? Uh, he took them to a local abandoned Navy base, which was known to be a fun place to explore and do graffiti. During the hangout, he acted oddly possessive over her, grabbing at her all day and trying to isolate her from the rest of her small friend group. The group decided they did not like this weird behavior and took an Uber to a music venue slash bar called The Willow. Andrew followed them in his own Uber to the same venue. Holy fuck. And kept ordering the underage girls shots. He, le he then later pulled her around the corner and forcibly tried to make out with her with her roommates until they uh, until her roommates came over and intervened. Okay, this is the part of the stream where I have to make a small correction. Uh, I did not know that this that the Navy story was about an underage girl, so uh, I have to make a small correction to what I said earlier. Uh, actually, it does turn out that it does seem like there is uh, a, a, a decent, a sizable amount of evidence that Andrew Callahan has preyed on minors. So uh, that's my mistake from not realizing that the Navy story was about a 17 year old. I did not realize that. Andrew followed them in his own Uber to the same venue and kept ordering the underage girl shots, then later pulled her around the corner and forcibly tried to make out with her until her roommates came over and intervened. They got her to get away from him and the girl kept repeating she had a boyfriend. Andrew responded, it's cool. I have a long distance girlfriend and we are open. Do you want to have a threesome with us, when, with, with us when she comes to town next week? And kept her in a corner, pushing her on the idea until her roommate's boyfriend went over and tried to fight him. The two broke away from Andrew and left the bar to go home. But Andrew followed them halfway home to their dorms until they started to sprint off in fear. Another odd note for is that Andrew, for some reason, lied about his age. He told the girls he was 22, but taking place in 2017, that would have been impossible. He would have been roughly 20. He also must have had a fake ID because he was buying them drinks. Another note, some commenters have questioned how the 17-year-old got into a bar. One, it was an 18-plus venue with a bar attached. And two, that specific bar, bar was notorious for being packed with underage people, according to a Redditor who has been posting in the New Orleans subreddit for over two years. Just because I've also seen a few people question it, the venue bar Andrew followed girls to from the Navy base was at the time notorious for being packed with underage and high schoolers basically every night. Basically saw very few actual college students, even at most some freshmen. Very believable that a 17 year old would be there. So this is somebody who is a verified local giving their personal accounts. Now, none of this is hard evidence. Um, yeah, however, uh, people have noted which bar it is. Uh, yeah, liquor laws are very lax in New Orleans, says another New, New Orleans local. Uh, and let's see, uh, real quick, I just wanna make sure what we have here. Here we go. And this has all, of course, been accounted to, uh, been accounted in a large series of texts, which, you know, we, we can go over. We, we read the story, they, they transposed the texts that we just saw. This was the text that was sent originally uh, and posted to the Channel 5 subreddit. Now, uh, while there is not as much uh, hard evidence for this story, there is a number of witnesses to this event, uh, people who've signed on to it, and it does seem to be a uh, credible location. It does seem to be a place where he was 
uh, he was at the time. So all of that stacks up. It says they were 17. Uh, yes. Um, friend of Dana's came forward and spoke about his own partner's interaction with Andrew while she was 17. So according to the person who brought this story forward, which was a, which was the partner of the, per, of the victim, the partner of the victim to, uh, told the story for the victim so that the victim could remain anonymous. Um, and this is also, by the way, a friend of Dana, who is the person who we last watched. We just watched Dana's story. Again, a very credible story. Uh, and Dana has you know, said this is a friend of mine who came forward to me about this, who also had an issue with him because he was there at the time. Yeah. So yes, uh, this is right here. His own partner's interaction with Andrew while she was 17. Okay. Here we go. So this is another post. Uh, this post was posted uh, 11 days ago. This is a direct post, which was posted to H3H3. Uh, and this was posted after uh, Ethan confirmed that in a private conversation with Andrew, Andrew had admitted that the major allegations, the the uh, the relationships that were being alleged did happen. And he, he seemed to uh, doubt the characterization of them, but not the relationships themselves. And this person posted their allegation directly to H3H3. We're going to read through this one real quick. Andrew's allegations are true, as painful as that is. As all the victims come forward and I see constant cycles of victim blaming continue to perpetuate, I feel that it is my job to come forward and say that I also had a similar experience with Andrew. Before people come for me, I can message the mods with proof that I met him, texts with our plans, everything that proves that we did in, in fact meet up several times. I was a fan and when I saw on Instagram that he was in my city, I DM'd him and he asked me to hang out. We hung out one night, had a good time, nothing sexual happened beyond kissing and I felt comfortable seeing him again. I told him multiple times that I was not wanting to have sex or do anything that night, and he listened. A few days later, we made plans to hang out again. After a while, he asked me to come into his RV, and I did. At this time, he started kissing me and asking me to have sex with him. I repeatedly stated that I did not know if I wanted to have sex and that I really, th I really didn't think that I wanted to have sex. He continued to pressure me, ask me to blow him or have sex with him. As a survivor of multiple sexual assaults, I started to hope that maybe if I just blew him, it would stop. While I did that, he called one of the men he worked with to tell him he needed a condom. He then continued continued to ask me to have sex until finally I gave in. So notice there's another there's another thing that keeps coming up in these stories, which is that Andrew seems to like to take advantage of his entourage. He has friends who do not care what he's doing, who will help him, who will apply pressure, who will make sure that the people that he is victimizing, allegedly, um, don't feel like there's any way out. Like they're alone and that he has support and they do not. Anyway, after so many requests, I felt that I had no other option or that, that it was the only option. I remember dissociating and hoping that it would just end soon. Afterwards, I felt so uncomfortable at that, about the situation. I saw him again, hoping that I would feel better about the situation. Eventually, I talked to my friends about how I did not want to have sex and was supported by my friends. I was so embarrassed as I was a huge fan and I couldn't believe it had gone so wrong. I don't think Andrew is an irredeemable person as I think accountability and change is important, but the victim blaming has become too much and I was stunned yesterday to get a text from my friend that others were saying that he did the same to them. So this is somebody who didn't even hear about this through the buzz, like through the, through the direct internet. They heard this because a friend said, a friend saw these allegations and said, that happened to you. Other people are coming forward. I don't doubt that this post will face the same scrutiny, but I felt that I should come forward for others that have been so re-traumatized by those who choose to call survivors liars. I am overwhelmed by the sheer amount of support by many of you. It means a lot to me and I won't forget it. I'm a big member of this community being H3H3 community on my main account and it was special to see grace and kindness given to sur survivors in prior situations. I me messaged the H3H3 mods to send my text and photo as proof as I don't want to be doxxed as this post is now being reported in online news articles. When they get back to me, I will update in regards to the slut shaming comments. I don't know what to say beyond I hope you learn more about assault and rape culture before continuing to attack others. 
So as we can see here, this is another person who contacted and did their best to reach the mods and went through every single path they could to verify their story. All right, and now we have another TikTok, okay? Oh, that account has also gone private. Uh, let's see. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Isn't it terrible how many accounts came forward about this and had to go private immediately? Do we have the texts here? So this person verified with texts. They verified with, with, with their texts that they did indeed. Holler if you want. Here's Andrew Callahan. Holler if you want a party when we arrive on January 10th, 2020. Uh, I'm down for a few bears. Can't, beers can't go hammy. Uh, come to the Golden Gopher downtown. Real place. I need a few. Let me know when I'm ready. Okay, cool. Phone gonna die. I'm here, but you're invited. Golden Gopher. Calling Uber soon. Patio. Lol. Okay. Now I'm gonna see if I can find this t this TikTok real quick because all of these TikToks have gone down it seems, or at least a lot of them have. Okay, so we don't get to watch the original story, but we can at least see the the account of it. Okay. Uh, Andrew invited her to a dive bar called the Golden Gopher in Los Angeles. She met up and was drinking with some friends. Then later they went to a house party. Obviously she had been drinking. After the party, Andrew repeatedly asked the woman to let him come back to her house. She refused, saying she just wanted to be friends and didn't want to have sex. However, Andrew continued to ask and pressure her. Eventually the woman gave in. Now we get to Charlotte's story. We read Charlotte already in the Rolling Stone. Um... And uh, that's the one that we already read already. Charlotte was the person who had this happen when she was 18 and Andrew was 19. Uh, Charlotte has verified her entire story with Rolling Stone and a local newspaper here in Seattle called The Stranger. Uh, so you can actually see here that The Stranger also, more women accuse YouTuber Andrew Callahan of sexual misconduct and assault. His lawyer won't let us publish her response on his behalf. In videos posted online, the Seattle Rays document. So here we have it again. This is the whole story. Here is his statement. We've already heard his statement. Uh, and this is them going in and verifying the various stories, including uh, Charlotte, which is the name that she's using. Charlotte or Anna are the two names that she used, that, that she was known by, the, the pseudonyms that were given to her so that she could remain anonymous. After providing many physical cues of, uh, uh, here we go, sorry, I'll read the whole, the whole story one more time just so we have this in order. She went out for coffee with him and eventually he brought her back to his apartment with plans to drink wine and watch a movie. She states that once they got into the apartment, there was an abrupt shift in tone in the evening. The two started kissing, which seemed okay at least uh, at least okay with Charlotte, but then she describes at one point Andrew purposefully poured wine on my shirt, proceeded to take off my shirt, and then lick the wine off of my chest. This happened very abruptly and I completely froze up. I felt up, I felt unsafe and incredibly violated. That is indeed uh, a huge, a huge uh, advancement in the situation. And if somebody expresses discomfort with advancing the sexual te the the sexual thing that's an idea that you should stop um yeah andrew then placed his hand on her crotch and charlotte started to uh verbally refuse his advances advances after providing many physical cues of my discomfort i eventually made it very clear verbally that i was not interested in continuing things he wasn't taking a simple no for an answer and consequently it turned into me trying to make up an array of excuses as to why i didn't want to have sex he kept insisting that i need to get him off because i was giving him blue balls by not having sex with him he repeated that phrase many many times it was a long back and forth of him trying to guilt me into sexual acts charlotte eventually left giving a car ride to to Andrew and the two never spoke again. Rolling Stones has confirmed that Charlotte has sent them proof that she had been complaining about Andrew's behavior to friends since at least 2019 via screen grabs and full screen recordings. She also states that she came forward because of Caroline's story. That's the first TikToker we watched. This is something that has bugged me for years, left me with a bad taste in my mouth, but that's never been a reason to come out and announce this guy had harassed me because quite frankly, every woman I know has had an experience like this, which is bleak, but that's the world we live in. Okay? Next, okay, uh, here we go. A woman under the alias of Jane did an interview with The Stranger. She said she first met Andrew in Seattle at the Madison Park Dock during summer 2017 while he was with friends, or while with friends. In their meeting, he was charismatic and easy to get along with, but she made him know early on she was not interested in him. She also describes hearing from a friend that Andrew was frisky. 
Next year, a very drunk Jane met Andrew again at a Lower East Side bar in New York. They went to a more isolated upstairs area and he des and she describes what happens after her friends left and she was alone. Now again, this is an interview that was done and verified by The Stranger, a local, uh, a, a local re a very, very famous newspaper in the Seattle area. Uh, he just started making moves on me, kissing me, groping me, moving my hands to touch him, forcing my head down. Jane tried to move away, but Andrew followed her. I stood up and walked out of there and went straight to the train. I was sitting there while waiting for the train and Andrew showed up. He had followed me there. He had followed her to the train. While, remembering, while I remember him saying throughout the night that he was staying somewhere nearby, he also was saying it wasn't a good situation and asking if he could stay where I was staying. He was pleading with me to go on with him. I yelled at him to go and, and told him to go away and I was like, leave me alone. He did eventually leave and I feel like part of the reason he did was because there were a lot of other people on the, on the train platform that heard me screaming at him. She describes the encounter as traumatizing and a personal hell of my own flashbacks. She said only a week later that she ran into him again in Seattle. He came right up to me and sat next to me and was being really touchy. I just felt frozen in that moment. Jane sent Andrew a message the next day where he said, our interaction got a bit uncomfortable and I'm only interested in being platonic friends with you. Andrew responded by saying, yeah, I didn't think yesterday was uncomfortable. And also that he was drunk as fuck in New York before sending a heart message along with a request to see her again. Jesus fucking Christ. Jane said his response made her uncomfortable as she blocked him after she, after that she felt that, she, that he had dismissed her concerns. I remember hoping that he would take accountability for making me feel uncomfortable and making moves while I was too drunk to consent and it was not an easy message to send. I felt that his response brushed it off. So what we can now see is that through four heavily verified stories, there is a repeated pattern. I mean, we're talking about people telling about him not taking no for an answer over and over and over again. They have screenshots and videos of the text that they sent at the time. This was back in 2017. This is years of, of, of separate people having the exact same experience of this guy following them, stalking them, uh, pressuring them with fake, uh, with, with, with fake situations like, I don't have a place to stay, and then never taking no for an answer, pushing and pushing and eventually advancing to physical violation. It is unbelievable. Okay. Let's continue. So we have another one next. Let me make sure, let me see if this TikTok is even able to work. Let's see? No. Okay. Hold on a second. Every single link to TikTok has been broken. All of these accounts have gone private, which is wild to see, even for a situation like this. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be up anymore. Okay, we're going to read the account. We're not going to look for them. I'm not going to spend forever searching for the actual TikTok. Um, on January 14th or 15th, a woman posted a series of TikToks while using a face filter to stay anonymous. She states that she met Andrew on a dating app Hinge in July 2021. After making contact, the two planned to meet up at an L.A. bar. They planned for Andrew to pick her up and then go out to the bar together. However, Andrew came to pick her up in pretty much pajamas and asked if they could immediately if they could go upstairs or inside. She asked if they were still going to the bar and Andrew said that it was too late. The woman invited him upstairs saying that he seemed harmless. After a conversation about his work without asking, he went in for a, a kiss pretty aggressively, but the woman didn't stop him. After a few minutes, Andrew asked to go further. She tells him she's on her period, but Andrew says that he was fine with that. He des she describes feeling frozen but decides to continue andrew then asks to film the act to which the girl was reluctant again but eventually agreed when andrew said that she could use her own personal phone to record so that she could decide whether or not to send it after performing the sexual act he made her send the video before he left which she states felt pressuring yeah that is that's coercive that's very coercive. The two continued a sexual relationship after that. She describes feeling led on, emotionally manipulated, because even on the first date, Andrew described seeing a family in his future and didn't have any problems with her son. After a few more dates, the woman tried to cut Andrew off because she felt like it was she felt like she, she was being treated like a hookup to him. But states that when she refused to meet him again, he would emotionally manipulate her into see into letting him see her again. She also states that she would have been okay with just hooking up as long as Andrew was more upfront about his intentions, but Andrew, but felt that Andrew complicated and manipulated things for whatever reason. The woman then states that Andrew stealthed her the last time that they have sex. And it says here, stealthing is the act of secretly having sex without a condom when the recipient only consented to sex with a condom. 
Stealthing, by the way, is rape. Uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Stealthing is rape, uh, as far as I'm concerned. She said Andrew was expected to wear condoms during sex and all of their previous sex he had used them. She also describes Andrew knowing that she wasn't on birth control and at this point in her life did not want to have an abortion. Mid-sex, she found out that Andrew had stealthed her, but she let the sex continue because in the moment, she it felt like him taking their relationship more seriously. After the date, she felt that Andrew took advantage of the fact that she liked him, wanted a relationship, and she was consistently push and, and he was consistently pushing boundaries and pressuring her in ways she was not okay with even outside of the stealthing incident. She also stated the two were not drunk during the ev event and posted an image of their DMs. So here we have a, a uh, an image of her initial DMs from February 5th, the dates that she stated. Uh, so stealthing is a fucking horrible thing to do to somebody. It's incredibly dangerous to women's health because obviously um, you have a right to have control over whether you're going to get pregnant or not. Um, yeah, really, really bad. Okay, we are approaching. Uh, we are approaching the end of the allegations for now. So there's one more that we need to read through. Okay, this is Evan Andrews' producer. This is Andrews' producer Evan. Sexual assault allegations. An anonymous woman DM'd me to let me know that Andrew's camera and main producer Evan had sexually assaulted her. She states that she was invited out with Andrew and his crew after one of their live shows in 2022. Talking with Evan, she suggested a bar she knew because it's literally right on the same block as my apartment. At the Once at the bar, she describes that while she chose to drink, Andrew's team definitely pressured her to drink. To drink. An example being when she refused to drink, they would mention everyone else was drinking and would make her feel bad. At the start of the night, she describes that everyone was buying her drinks, but at the end, it was just Evan buying them and specifically buying her drinks. She also describes the drinks just being handed to her and not even knowing the alcohol content. One of her friends stated that at the end of the night, Evan was talking to her while she was nearly incoherent and was leaning heavily against the bar. Unfortunately, shortly after, the woman's friends decided to leave and the drunk woman eventually blacked out. Okay, small thing, this is not me putting the blame on anybody but the rapist. However, if you are a friend, never leave your friend behind if they're drunk, okay? Seriously, never leave your friends behind if they're drunk. Just don't do it. Just be the honorable one, be the brave soldier who stands and makes sure that your friends get home safe. Just never leave your friends alone, even if you think that they can take care of themselves. Uh, you never know in a situation like this what could go wrong. You should always try to stick together with your friends. Yeah. Knowing where she lived due to her mentioning it earlier, Evan carried her home and none of Andrew's crew stopped him. That is insane. That right there is fucking ridiculous. Evan carried her to her home and nobody stopped. The woman had a habit of leaving her door unlocked so Evan was easily able to get inside. Whether she mentioned to him she left her door unlocked earlier in the night or Evan took a guess, uh, is not uh, the, the girl does not know or remember when she awoke she was being groped and touched immediately she said no to Evan multiple times but he continued trying to coerce her even grabbing her hand and her head in order to try and force her into a blow job or hand job as she describes it I kept saying no and he only stopped when I finally started crying he then left her apartment the woman had to piece together what happened to her the next day by talking to her friends and going back to the bar to speak to the bouncer Hopefully you can see me as a reliable narrator. As I can say, the woman sent me a picture of herself with Andrew as proof. So this is the the writer of this thread confirming that they were sent ev like hard evidence of this. Now, we can't see that necessarily. Uh, as of right now, she's not comfortable with her picture being public, understandable, although I will share a compilation of her comments that she made to me. So this is this last one here is we're taking the word of the person who's been running this thread. Okay. Now the rest of these are a number of 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 uh, a, a number of of smaller allegations that um, that that support these stories, but don't have as much evidence. So we're not going to go into these as they don't really have as much evidence, or even like uh, uh, like uh, I guess like like they're not as credible as as I would like to. I'd like to fixate on these ones here. So. <sighs> You guys see why I thought this was important to go over? Um, yeah, they don't have as much corroboration, unfortunately. 
Um, and also some of them are about different things that aren't about this, this, uh, this core issue. So as you can see, the allegations against Andrew Callahan are quite credible. They are quite numerous. Uh, I think that it is fair to say that every person uh, who is looking at this should consider uh, Andrew Callahan a, uh, a, a, a very dangerous person to be around, a very, very dangerous person for women to be around, uh, a, 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 until, in, until a significant amount of further information, uh, which may or may not even exist, comes forward. I don't see, uh, I, can, I can foresee almost no situation in which, in which Andrew Callahan can produce evidence um, contrary to what he's already said. Because keep in mind, once again, that Andrew told Ethan Klein, which we are about to watch in just a second here, uh, Andrew told Ethan Klein uh, that, uh, that, that these encounters were real, but that he didn't agree with the way that they went. So we're going to do we're going to do two more things before we get to the end of this segment and move on to something else uh, that's not going to be as stressful and, uh, and and potentially triggering as the topics that we've been talking about for the last uh, you know few hours, which is we're going to watch what Ethan what Ethan from H three H three had to say about this. So let's watch the the segment. Uh, of Ethan Klein's testimony about what he talked to Andrew Callahan about. And then we are going to wrap this up reviewing once again, excuse me, Andrew Callahan's um, response video. And we're gonna, then we'll have a, sh a short conversation about this. So let's watch this. I, be I believe both girls. So, but when the second girl came out I meet. I was like, okay, I need to talk to Andrew about this. I mean, listen, he is my friend. We do have a relationship. I'm not just going to go to the internet and start talking about all this without even reaching out to him. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, I needed to hear from him what happened. So... I talked to him and he was, you know, look, he's in a really bad mental headspace. Obviously he was like soaring on top of the world and now he's like canceled. Uh, but, but I, I tried to, I wanted the details. I said, yo, what's up with these allegations? You got to tell me what's going on. I talked on the phone with him. The first girl, he told me, I'm just going to tell you what he said. By the way, I was hoping to wait to talk about this till he put out a statement. He told me that he was going to put out a statement today at 12. I think he's working on a statement. I guess it's going to come out today. Um, I can find out. Maybe I'll text him and find out when. So I'm sure he wants people to read his statement. So if I could read it on stream, that'd be good. I wanted to make sure he was like in a safe place, that he wasn't. Um... Why are you guys saying stop? Don't say anything. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just telling you what happened, okay? I'm just being transparent. Oh, you don't want me to say what he told me? The fuck? Why? I don't understand your guys' I don't understand the logic, but y'all, a lot of y'all say don't say anything. So. I imagine they think no, no, it's not private. He, he, listen, guys, this, it was a private conversation, but what he told me, he sent me stuff that he want that like he wanted me to convey. Okay. You know what I mean? This isn't, I'm not like, um, saying stuff that was said to me in private. If that's what you guys are afraid of, like he was sending me stuff to show to Hassan text messages and stuff and stories like, cause he, he's saying that he wants people to hear his side of stuff at least if people are talking about it and so he told me this stuff 
uh, with the understanding that I, I might share it. So what we have right now is Ethan saying that he believes the victims uh, that came forward uh, explicitly. He's very clear about that. And also he is saying that he had a private conversation with Andrew Callahan. Uh, in my experience, uh, um, at least being online, uh, Ethan is a, a very trustworthy person on topics like this. Ethan is very, very, is not going to lie about having a conversation with Andrew Callahan. Uh, I do believe that he went to Andrew Callahan and I do believe he asked him pointed questions about this. So, yeah, let's continue. People are saying, why are you conveying things from I'm just literally saying what he said, but if you don't want me to talk about it, then I won't. I don't understand that necessarily. From YouTube chat uh, says, not gonna lie, I hate how many guy guy friend groups tend to do this, uh, where they have a, a blasé or lenient attitude towards creepy behavior and not warn or tell the women around around them about it. Uh, I will say that is what we that is again what we talk about when we're saying things like rape culture, where uh, it is not seen as pressing to warn people about the behaviors of your friend. Instead, uh, well-intentioned guys will often sort of quietly try to take it on their own shoulders to, to like keep keep that guy out of trouble, which is like, interestingly, uh, sometimes it has the reverse effect of actually uh, assisting. Like I mentioned before, this whole entourage thing where uh, he has, where Andrew Callahan keeps people around him who increase the pressure on any girl because they he's there with friends and they're alone. Um, yeah. So, yeah. But I don't think that's really what, I don't know that that's what, what uh, Ethan is doing here, but I understand what you're talking about and I wanted to touch on that. I mean, I'm reading chat. I'm trying to get some logic here. No, he did not say they're lying, guys. Uh, let me at least fucking explain before you'll jump down my throat. Like, hello, let me talk. It's so hard to talk about this stuff, which I get, you know, the people get really... <sighs> There's high emotions and stuff when you talk about this stuff, so it's it's hard for everybody. I'm not, you know, I don't... I totally understand the people in the chat have strong opinions about this, right? Like that that I get. And me too. That's what this whole is just very hard to talk about. But I'm just going to be I just want to be transparent. I mean, he's going to put out a statement that is more detailed and obviously the way that he wants to say stuff, but I'm not betraying his trust or anything. I'm sure he would be fine to know. Look, chat, yeah, I mean, listen, it's okay. I understand why y'all are getting emotional. I'm not even mad. I'm just trying to understand why you guys said. Um, Planet Kaylee said sadness. I don't know what to think. I've been essayed and worse. I do feel men can redeem themselves and his response would be a great interest to women like me. I appreciate that uh, comment, Planet Kaylee. Chat needs to calm down. Ethan's doing his best. Tough situation. It's all good. Say whatever you think needs to be said on your part. Ignore the chat. You're doing great, sweetie. My feelings as a fan of all parties, we don't want you to defend him and help him if he wants to misconstrue the party. Listen, I'm not, I'm not doing that. It's not my intention. I said straight out the gate. Can I just, let me just say it before everyone makes assumptions and shit. Let me just say what I was going to say. So, first I just wanted to make sure that, he told me he was like at a psych ward, he was not doing well, and he was having panic attacks and stuff, and I first of all wanted to make sure that he was safe, that he wasn't going to hurt himself, that he was with people that cared about him, obviously I don't, I think, I'm, I don't want him to die, I'm hoping none of y'all think he, he should die for this, do you? And so I did confirm that he's doing okay. So that was a relief to me. Again, I'm not defending him. And I believe the those victims 100% since they came out with their videos. 
so what was I saying? So, well, what I was going to say before y'all jumping to conclusions is that he confirmed what they're saying is true. Okay. Y'all fucking, you know what I mean? He confirmed that he knew the girls and that he had encounters with them. So right out the bat, you know what I mean? He was pretty open and basically that's what I wanted to hear, right? Like he, he confirmed that this stuff basically happened. What do you mean he's gaslighting me? He literally told me it happened. Like, what the fuck? Guys, listen. Oh, no, the abusers isn't mentally well. Listen, I, I know it's not about him being the victim, but I don't want him to die. Okay? Like, I have a obligation as a human being to another human being to make sure that he's not, like, suicidal and i'm just gonna not ch you check on him like you guys gotta pick anyway what the fuck i gotta stop reading the chat y'all get in my head stun locking me yeah don't look at chat fuck now i know what it's like to be stun locked but anyway it's not about him right so <laughs> you know sorry i gotta stop reading chat the one time i read chat i gotta stop reading it all right, let me get my fucking thoughts together on this. So, I mean, my main, my main, my main takeaway is that he confirmed he knew the, the girls, right? Um, and basically, that's all I'll say. I mean, I talked to him a lot. I wanted to get, I wanted to hear from him what happened. And, that's all I can, that's all I'll say is that he confirmed he knew them. So like that, that's not defending him at all. I mean, if anything is corroborating what they said. So I basically am just waiting. I really just waiting for a statement to kind of, I, I there's not even really a conclusion. I mean, it sucks. You know what the fuck? I mean, I mean, what the fuck can I say? It sucks. It's very upsetting. It's weird because like I'm both a fan of him and a friend of him. So it's just. It really sucks. What can I say? I mean, y'all fucking in the same boat as me. That's it. That's all I got to say about it. I mean, I don't have any other fucking thing to say about it this time. I don't... Some of y'all want me to, like... So, as everybody in chat is pointing out, that was a... There was a lot of preamble in that video, but I just wanted you to see it in its organic form. This was the... That was the section in which he talked about it all, and you got a sort of an idea for his chat, and also how difficult it was for Ethan to talk about this. However, he confirms that Andrew Callahan, in private, to him, both confirmed that the, the events were real, and that the people were not lying about the encounters. So... If you add that up with everything else, that none of these people who came forward None of them were lying about ever having been with him. All of them were, are now confirmed to have been with him from even from him. I think that means, I think that gives us a pretty clear, uh, um, a pretty clear path as to the credibility of all of these things. These people came out independently. They tried for years to have their story be told. And Andrew Callahan himself in private has confirmed that they were not lying about the events happening. Although, of course, as we are about to see, we are going to watch his uh, uh, his response. I am not going to. I'm going to try to avoid to. Um, uh, 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 yes, at the time. Yes, yes. Vox Syndicate. Sorry, I should be clear. I should be clear. At the time, there were only two stories that had happened so far, which was Charlotte and uh, and Caroline. Those were the two stories that, that had come out at that time. Afterwards, Dana came out, then the Navy story came out, and then finally a story uh, which we were not able to watch, which was from the lady who was stealthed, uh, who was completely anonymous. We did not have her name, although, uh, uh, again, she was confirmed by uh, a number, by, by 
you know, as credible as you can get. And she also originally posted a video, but that video is no longer available. Uh, so Ethan confirmed the two first stories, which both of which contain uh, 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 some, some extremely troubling things that establish a pattern of behavior. Now, the final thing we're going to watch here is Andrew Callahan's response. And we're going to listen to this. And now many of you heard this the other day. However, I want you all to listen to this and I want you to think about uh, the way that he talks about it. And I want you to, 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 to sort of reflect upon all of the receipts that we've gone over today, all of the stories that we've gone over today, the reasons why these stories are credible. And I want you to think about how he responds to them and then we'll talk about it. Yes, this is a rewatch, but this is important because when we watched it the other day, it was without the context of all of this. Uh, let's go. All right. Um, I never thought I'd make a video like this, but um, I think there's an important conversation to be had. And I just want to be fully accountable, honest and uh, transparent with all of you guys. So I'd like to start by thanking every single person who's came out uh, in the past week. Um, to speak about different ways in which my behavior has made them feel um, uncomfortable or pressured during a sexual situation and to people who said that I've made unwanted advances and uh, had a hard time with rejection. Um, I'm sure this was not easy to do. It's never easy to speak out. And it was uh, hard for me to hear as well, because to be honest with you, up until this point, I didn't even really realize that I had this pattern that had affected multiple people. Um, I'd also like to apologize for my silence. Um, I think that when I want to just I want to just point out here that these stories confirm that it's not just about a pattern. It's not just about a pattern. This guy followed people back to their house. This guy pushed people to the degree that he was pushing himself on them physically. There was no it's not about just about the pattern. The pattern is for our information to avoid him. The pattern is not uh, in and of itself the problem. The problem is the behaviors that he did that the crap that he did to other people. Notice how he sidesteps that entirely. I just that that part really irks me and I want you to pay attention to that. This stuff first came out. I was in a state of denial and shock. Um, I was, you know, just riding the high for my movie that just came out. And then within 48 hours, I was denounced by my closest collaborators. And uh, my name was printed in, in, in 40 different news outlets uh, next to the words sexual misconduct. And I just kind of spiraled into a mental health crisis. Uh, I'm okay now, but I don't really think this is about me. This is about the people that I've affected. So I just want to express my complete sympathy, respect, and uh, support for anyone who I've done wrong by. And I really want to do better and be fully accountable for everything that I've done. So yes. that being said, I want to make a few yeah, things Ducky. clear. Um, I've always taken no for an answer. Um, as far as consent, I've... So he says that he believes the victims and then he refutes the main the main claim of every single person who came forward every single person who, who who came forward claimed that he was not able he was definitively not able to take no for an answer so he says oh yeah yeah you know i my sympathies go out to you but you're lying is what he's saying here he's not saying it outright but that's what that's what his words linked together to mean never uh, overstep that line um but you know, I think I want to have a more nuanced and important conversation about power dynamics, pressure and uh, coercion, because, you know, like I said, I think for, for a long time, I was behaving in a way that I actually thought was normal. Um, I thought that, you know, going home from the bar alone made you a loser. Um, I thought that persistence was a form of flattery. And I thought that, you know, if at first somebody was reluctant, you know, they're playing hard to get, just try harder. And if you think someone's feeling you, you know, make a physical advance and uh, see if they go with it. And I think that especially I realized when so many uh, young people, especially young men, rushed to defend me uh, when this stuff first started coming out, that this type of sex pest behavior is normalized and a lot of people think this stuff is normal when I don't think that it is and I think that I this is not sex pest behavior let's be clear now that you can sit here with me and we have looked through all of the evidence we, we have looked through all of these things we've heard uh, we've seen the evidence with our own eyes to the best of our ability when the videos had not been removed and some of them we found anyway 
uh, these we've 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 now heard from verified, uh, highly respectable newspapers that have written about this. Uh, and this is not sex pest behavior. That this is rapist behavior, not sex pest behavior. Rapist behavior. Let's be clear about that. I want to be fully responsible for not having a fluid understanding of consent and what enthusiastic two-way consent looks like. This is not about enthusiastic consent. Enthusiastic consent is a very good topic to discuss, but this is not about enthusiastic consent. You went so far as to, to follow people, as to refuse to leave their cars. This is not about enthusiastic consent. This is about explicit violations of consent. People telling you, no, no, stop, no, and you still went on anyway. Um, that being said, a lot of the things that have been said online about me uh, are not true. A lot of things are missing really important contextual information that I think would change people's... Provide it. Put it out there. Where's the evidence? You say there's context that changes this? Put it out. Where is it? It's still not out. It's very strange, isn't it? None of these people are suing him, but he won't provide the evidence that he supposedly has. Let's continue. Interpretation of a lot of these situations, but I'm not here to invalidate anybody's lived experience. You already did. You already fucking did. Experience. Uh, if you feel pressured, you know, that's just what it is. I hope that young people and young men in particular can use my mistakes to learn and uh, move through life with a better understanding of consent. Um, as far as what I have planned, I'm not really sure what comes next. I mean, obviously, you know, reporting is my one true love and I'm 25 years old and I have my whole life ahead of me, but I really think that I need to do. It's interesting. You know, it's interesting that he put that part in there. I got, I'm 25. I got my whole life ahead of me. That is literally the stereotype of what somebody tries to say to not get in trouble for something heinous that they've done. It is literally a stereotype. I've, I've got my, he's got his whole, your honor, he's got his whole life in front of him some serious work on myself and uh, figure myself out. So I'm going to start therapy sessions pretty much immediately. Um, also, not to blame alcohol, but I truly believe that uh, alcohol was a contributing factor to my... You gave the alcohol to other people. You gave alcohol to other people so that they were more drunk than you. This has been corroborated uh, across all of these stories, that you used alcohol as a tool to predate on people. Poor decision making. And I think that alcohol in general has had a devastating impact on my life. So I think I'm going to uh, make the decision to join the 12 step program for Alcoholics Anonymous and during this journey into sobriety. Notice also he says, I think I'm going to. This is so terrible. Doesn't it seem, doesn't this response seem even more terrible now that we've gone through everything? Those of you who are here when we reviewed it, when it first came out, when we reviewed it live without any prep, now that I've, now that the entire cases have been laid out in front of you, doesn't this seem even more disgusting, especially knowing that we know that he used, that he, that, that he allegedly used a apology to try and to, to get himself into a position where he could victimize someone? An apology. That is calculated. I'm, I want to apologize to you. Get them into the space. Get them into the car where you can take advantage of them. That's fucked up. And this is what we get? Disgusting. I want to take a serious step back from public life and, like I said, figure myself out. Um, and I hope that this reaches uh, the ears of anyone who's felt affected by me. Um, I'd love to reach out to you or I hope you can not. reach out to me even just for me to say I'm sorry. And I really apologize and I appreciate you all. Um, I also want to apologize to um, my closest collaborators, you know, my friends, my family, and people who will have to wear this stain on their career forever. No one else but you will have to. No one else. Everyone else made the correct decision. Tim and Eric dropped your ass. H3H3 dropping your ass. Hopefully Hassan will drop your ass. Hopefully everyone will drop your ass because you they don't wear the stain. You do. You're the one who did the thing. They're not doing it. Don't try to fucking implicate other people in this. Um, you guys don't deserve this, and uh, I love you guys. Uh, that being said, uh, if you never want to watch Channel 5 again, um, I understand. 
Um, I hope you remember the uh, missions of radical empathy and uh, media literacy uh, that we do you think Andrew Callahan was practicing radical empathy as he b b badgered and 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 uh, literally physically forced himself on other women? Do you think he was uh, on women? Do you think that he was he was practicing radical fucking empathy when he pretended to use an apology as a pretense to get someone in close contact and then he proceeded to rape them allegedly? Tried to put into the world through our through our coverage. Um, all right, that's all I want to say. Trash, a trash, a genuinely garbage bin, terrible, rotten, just absolutely fucking rotten response. Just beyond terrible. Oh my God, what an absolute, what an absolute embarrassment of a response. Clearly, uh, so, God, I, I feel like I did a pretty good job addressing all of the issues as we t dealt with them, but there's one thing I want to bring up, which is I've made multiple notes throughout this 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 uh, investigation, whatever we want to call this, this deep dive. I've made multiple references to the fact that none of the people, to our knowledge, um, are attempting to sue him. But, and yet he is using incredibly controlled legal language. Which makes me think, do you think that it's possible that he's going to try to sue them? Do you think that he's going to try to do the, uh, the, the Johnny Depp, I'm going to sue you for defamation approach? Um, because I think that's a legitimate possibility. I think uh, part of the reason that his, his apology video is so lawyerly is so carefully worded so as that he never admits any actual fault outside of making people feel bad um do you think it's possible because uh i think it's possible i think it is possible that he tries to go that route that he tries to uh like turbo gaslight these people uh and especially because so many of them have gone private uh, it makes me wonder if there are lawyers who have contacted the alleged victims and who have said, we need to get you a, a, legal, a legal defense for defamation ASAP. Because uh, we live in a very strange period of time where a whole bunch of people who are uh, very credibly accused of, uh, of, 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 sexual, uh, of sexual assault are beginning to try to use the law as a way to further silence their own victims. Very strange. JFK Jr. says, I think it's either prep in case he gets sued or so he doesn't walk himself into a lawsuit by accidentally admitting things. That's possible. It could be purely a defense, a, a purely defensive move. But I think it's weird because none of the people involved have, have made any indication that they were going to sue him for anything. And most of them acknowledge that there is no lawsuit that can happen because it would be very difficult to uh, prove any of the, uh, the uh, eventual, the, the actual events that they are, they are staking their reputation on this truth not for any personal gain very obviously all of their accounts are now locked and not accessible um but but rather that they are doing so to warn others i think it's very strange now of course we're going to have to wait and find out what happens there's likely to be more developments in this story at some point uh but now you've seen it all for yourself and i've given you my opinion and i've talked about some of the core issues uh Andrew Callahan, uh, in my opinion, should never be given a platform um, on any on any segment of the left, no matter how broad you go. That he should not be given a platform until he can, uh, in until or if he can prove that uh, that that he is a a a a, a person who can be. Uh, uh, safe around other people or or he can prove that there is something like he says that there's evidence that would change the the interpretation of the situation which let's see it where's the fucking evidence where's the evidence that would change what you did to these people allegedly and very very credibly allegedly 
I don't think that Andrew Callahan is somebody who can be trusted with any sort of platform. It is very clear to me that given that this, uh, given this history of allegations and the detail of these allegations, that using his that his platform is key to the way that he victimizes people. That he targets people based on their fan status. He targets fans. He tries to use his clout and his uh, notoriety as a way to pressure people. He uses his uh, his his little entourage as a way to pressure people. He uses his clout to uh, to to uh, uh, pr to to lull people into a false sense of security, and then he hurts them very badly. I don't think Andrew Callahan should ever be allowed to be given a platform. I think that as far as I'm concerned, he should find a new line of work. Maybe he should just work a normal job as a as a uh, burger flipper or a a a uh, you know a, a a meter reader or something along those lines because. Um, this type of behavior is very clearly, uh, uh, if uh, uh, all of these allegations point to him using his power as a micro celebrity uh, to, to harm people. He uses the small amount of power that he's received, social power, to harm people horribly. So, that's all there is to say on this particular issue. That is all of it. I've laid out everything that I was able to find so far. Uh, we watched as many of the videos as we were able to get. Uh, I did not know that I would need to download all of them in advance, so I didn't do it this time. So I apologize that we weren't able to watch the TikToks of the last two people because they are completely privated and hidden now. Um, however, we were able to read transcripts of those events, so you are able to get the full story. Um, uh, uh, fake Alec Kyle Parker says, in other words, Andrew Callahan is basically the definition of a predator. As far as we can tell, he is basically the definition of a predator, of somebody who is completely unsafe to be around, somebody who targets people who are vulnerable and, and exploits any vulnerability he can to try and get what he wants, that he will literally ignore every single level of, of boundary, that he will ignore every single level of, uh, of, uh, 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 of, of refusal that he will push through to the point of physically assaulting people uh, according to these allegations. Here's hoping that Channel 5 gets a new host. I'm sure they will be able to. Naomi says, thank goodness that this is over. It was honestly mentally exhausting. Tell me about it. I've been sitting on this crap for days. It's been on my mind and I'm very happy. Uh, uh, that That is, that is, I'm I'm very happy that we've been that we've managed to lay it out here in a single video that people can go watch and they can share with other people in order to get the information out there. Is the Channel Five Five name tainted? Well, isn't that what happened with All Gas No Breaks too? Didn't they both get that? Uh, unfortunately, it is too bad. There's also uh, it's too bad for for Channel Five for people who like the show Channel 5, that it seems like there are other members that were at least tangentially involved, including the producer, uh, who has allegations against him as well. Um, should I save Andrew's videos to archive.org? I don't think that's a bad idea. Honestly, Emo Anon, I don't think that's a bad idea at all. Uh, if, 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 it's, if it's work that you're passionate about, uh, which I can understand because I will agree that a lot of his videos are very, very interesting, entertaining, and informative, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, he appears to be a uh, rampant and dangerous predator.